right, if everybody could uh, come and take their seats. Very happy to invite everybody to our uh, Sculpture Eminent Seminar Series. And today's speaker is Brendan Baker, Assistant Professor from the University of Michigan in uh, Biomedical Engineering. Uh, he was actually uh, nominated to give the seminar by uh, Arvind Agarwal, Chair of Mechanical and Materials Engineering. Um, I believe you're part of CellNet, uh, involved in CellNet, which is one of our uh, engineering research centers, NSF uh, supported engineering research centers, one of the two that we have in the uh, department. Um, so the uh, screen is all yours. All right, thank you. Hi everyone, um, I'm Brennan Baker I'm from the University of Michigan, and what I was going to do today is sort of tell three distinct stories that are spanning natural materials, synthetic materials, and semi-synthetic materials, but all around the, the, the question of how does fibrosis occur and what are the cell types and their interactions with the matrix that are part of fibrotic disease. Okay, so I figured as biomedical engineers, this is probably a pretty broad audience, and I thought I would just start with the most broad topic about my group studies, which is the cell's microenvironments. And for anyone who uh, isn't a biologist, I'll just define what this is. So the microenvironment is the other cells and the extracellular matrix, the non-cellular components of the tissue, that provide a whole bunch of different cues, signals to cells to tell cells what to do. This could be when a cell divides, when a cell differentiates in a different cell type, when it moves around. And those cues come from, like I said, its interactions with other cells that it might be physically contacting or interactions with this matrix. And in this image, this is a TM image of, of cells within um, meniscal tissue, actually. You can just see this, this fibrillar matrix that the cells are engaging pretty uh, intimately. So there's a lot of different cues that are coming or rising from this tissue space. And I've just broken them down into some broad categories here, but like I said, interactions with other cells through receptors on the cell surface. Um, there can be soluble signals that are sort of diffusing through this tissue space or maybe tethered physically to the, to the extracellular matrix. And those are like growth factors and cytokines that we know have profound effects for what cells do upon receptor engagement. These tissues typically, um, almost all of our tissues are always experiencing mechanical forces, so stretch and fluid shear, all of those things can provide biological signals for cells to process and then respond to. And in particular, what my group is really interested in is these interactions between, uh, between the cell and the extracellular matrix. And we sort of think about the nature of the ligands that the cells engaging with its receptors, uh, the topography, the three-dimensionality of, of those structures, and the mechanical properties. So this is, I've broken these down into four different categories, but there's actually a lot of interaction between these things. So how the mechanics of, of the matrix influence, for example, growth factor receptors uh, engaging together and, and uh, densifying, that's a really important biological signal. So there's a lot of crosstalk between these, and it makes understanding these different signals in native tissues really, really challenging. So one approach that many people take is to use synthetic materials that are much simpler and where we can engineer in certain functionalities, certain features, certain signals to get uh, to, to answer the question of what do these signals do for the cell response. So the general approach is to take something uh, fairly simple, a, a simple polymer backbone like polyethylene glycol, many of you have sure have heard of, and then add in these, uh, uh, these individual functionalities, like a certain piece of ligand, certain mechanical properties, certain growth factors to, to answer questions about what those different cues are doing for cell being. The first example of this is all the way back from uh, the 90s. So Pelham and Wang took polyacrylamide gels. Many of you probably know these gels as the ones that proteins and DNA are run on. And what they found is that they could tune the two components to making a polyacrylamide gel and get different elasticities. And back in those days, I guess they didn't have tensile testers. So they showed that they could change the elasticity by hanging binder clips on these different gels. And the distension is obviously pretty different with the, the ratio of the, the two components. Then they functionalized these elastic surfaces with an adhesive uh, protein that cells could stick to, like collagen or fibronectin. And when they plated cells onto these, they found that this actually, the elasticity of these surfaces had a pretty profound influence on what cells did in terms of how they spread, how they form focal adhesions, how they organize their cytoskeleton, and how they polarize. And over longer time courses, and in subsequent work, many groups have shown that this 
these sort of shorter term morphological effects of substrate elasticity lead to pretty profound influences on what cells do from a functional perspective. So do they migrate? Will they undergo division events? Will they differentiate into a certain lineage if they're a stem cell? Um, will they lose their organization if they're a multicellular structure? So these are just two examples here. Uh, the top left is from Dennis Disher's work showing that adult MSCs will undergo lineage specific differentiation in response to the surface uh, stiffness. And on the right side is work from Bell Weaver's group. These are images of mammary epithelial asinine. So these like uh, sphere, hollow sphere structures that mimic the, the structures within breast tissue. And you can see that as the substrate uh, stiffness increases that these, these uh, structures are cultured on, this leads to a pretty profound change in how those are organized. And what they posit in this paper is that as the matrix becomes stiffer, similar to what's occurring in breast tissue as cancer progresses, these structures lose their normal homeostatic shape and start becoming migratory and invasive, and this might model some aspect of metastasis. So this model of two-dimensional elastomer or hydrogel surfaces with tunable stiffness has become a way to uh, model changes in disease or changes in tissues with disease. And I just mentioned an example of cancer, but what's actually occurring that leads to this change in stiffness in the peritumoral space is a change in the collagen architecture of that space. So these are images of in red uh, cancer cells and in green the collagen of the stroma surrounding this tumor. Uh, this is a mouse model of a tumor. And you can see that as uh, we go from a normal tissue to a cancer that's metastatic, there's really this pretty profound change in how those collagen fibers are organized um, and also how many, of their, how many of them there are. And there are other tissues where this is uh, quite relevant, other diseases. So what I'm mostly going to focus on today is not cancer, but on fibrosis. Um, but fibrosis is this conversion of healthy parenchymal space. So you can see in the lung, all this white space, which is the alveolar air space. But with the fibrotic or fibrosis of the lung, this open air space gets converted into this dense, collagenous, non-functional non -functional tissue. And this is a very um, common progression. It can occur in many different organs, uh, including <laughs> cirrhosis. So liver cirrhosis is a, a pretty typical fibrosis of the liver that occurs from alcoholism and another liver injury. And then systemic sclerosis, which is a skin and liver, or skin and lung disease that involves fibrosis of those respective tissues. Okay, so at the center of this disease process of fibrosis, I mean, there are many cellular players, but the one that the field is really focused on is this myofibroblast. That is what most people consider the, the disease driving cell of fibro fibrotic diseases. These cells can come from a number of different precursors. So they could be from the resident fibroblasts that live within that given organ. They could also be recruited from bone marrow and from other tissues, but they undergo a differentiation event into this myofibroblast. And this is shown with these uh, red fibers inside of them. And those red fibers are representing the alpha smooth muscle actin cytoskeleton within the cell, which is an isoform of actin that's more contractile than what a normal fibroblast would have. So what these cells do once they populate a tissue is they contract really hard. And that you remember the picture of the hands or even the, the liver or the lungs, those tissues eventually start shrinking from the contractures that these cells are, are exerting on the tissue. They also secrete excessive amounts of extracellular matrix that show those, those changes in the fibrous architecture around the tumor. Um, so those, these are the cells that are driving those, those changes in the collagen. Um, collagen-rich extracellular matrix. And there's a lot going on in this slide. I pulled it from a review, but the thing I would like to just focus on is this latter part, uh, sort of at the bottom, that there are these critical requirements for this differentiation event. So in particular, it's known now from a number of different studies, and I'll show an example in a second, that a stiff extracellular matrix and engagement to certain adhesive ligands of the extracellular matrix are a, are a requirement for this differentiation event. And without those pieces, you don't get, you don't see this activation. So one example, just to show you, is using similar types of two-dimensional substrates with tunable elasticity, and then culturing group cultured normal human lung fibroblasts on top of these surfaces 
and they spanned a, a stiffness range which they thought reflected healthy versus fibrotic lung. And what they're standing for in green is albus muscle act. That was in red in that diagram, but those are the, the um, contractile structures within the cell uh, that the cell is using to exert forces on its extracellular matrix. <clears throat> and so what they're showing here is that as they go from a soft to a stiff matrix, the amount of this alpha muscle actin is increasing, meaning there are more and more of these myofibroblasts that are differentiating. So this has led to this notion uh, and sort of an understanding of why is fibrosis such a progressive disease? Why after a certain point does the disease just continue to go even if the insult, the injury to the tissue is taken away? And the idea is that once you differentiate an initial population of myofibroblasts, and these cells are contracting and synthesizing more and more matrix to stiffen their extracellular space. Now they have a signal that would reinforce more myofibroblast activation. So if new fibroblasts came in to the tissue or were recruited to the tissue, they would receive this stiff extracellular cue and be able to undergo another round of differentiation. So this becomes a self-propagating um, self disease. So one elephant in the room, I guess, would be that we know that cells inside of our tissues are not sitting on flat surfaces. These are not elastic materials that have a uh, even coating of extracellular protein on top of them. But in fact, what was there? I just realized all the titles were cut off. <laughs> um, but most of our stromal ECMs, and stroma is the space where fibrosis originates, are actually these fibrous networks uh, made out of collagen primarily, but also fibronectin, elastin, and fibril. These are all fibrillar proteins. This collagen in particular uh, is uh, pretty important because it's mostly what we are made of from a non-cellular component. And collagen in our tissues can be arranged as these sort of loose stromal tissues that I was alluding to, um, and dense connective tissues, so tendon, ligament, cartilage, all of those are also made out of primarily collagen. Um, in the case of the myocardium, and I know there's a lot of cardiovascular interest here, the sheaths, the extracellular sheaths that line the myo bundles are also made out of type 1 collagen, and that's also where the fibroblasts live uh, that can become activated in the, in the context of cardiac fibrosis. Lastly, uh, fibrin, so fibrin is a wound healing provisional matrix that forms right after uh, initial tissue injury that is also clearly a, a fibrous network, and that's probably important as well in fibrosis, given that part of fibrosis is the wound healing response. So there's a number of differences between culturing cells on flat elastomer or hydrogel surfaces versus cells that are sitting inside of three-dimensional networks of fibers. And that's something that's really been uh, of interest to my group. And one of our, our uh, constant themes across our work is trying to build systems where we can study cells in the bottom environment, cells that are inside of three-dimensional fibrous networks. And there's many distinctions, but primarily what we've been really focused on is the differences in mechanics. So cells on the top, they're sort of experiencing a uniform coating of extracellular matrix. And then on, underneath that is the elastomer surface that varies in stiffness. And so you can sort of think about adhesive ligand that the cell engages versus mechanics as decoupled as two separate things. But in the case of cells sitting in a network of fibers, those two pieces are put together. It's the adhesive ligand that comprises the fiber uh, that also defines the mechanics. Those are intertwined. So we've been working on building systems where we can tune individual aspects of fibrillar materials. And we generally have taken a synthetic approach, although I'll show you some examples that are using natural materials that are fibrous as well. Um, and we've been interested in tuning individual properties of fibers, populations of fibers, uh, as well as boundary conditions and mechanical forces that cells are experiencing inside of these materials. All right, so I showed you uh, some of these images of nasty fibrotic tissues and this conversion of, um, of the open parenchymal healthy space, airspace in the lung into this dense fibrous matrix. And I wanted to give you a three-dimensional view of what this actually looks like from a cell's perspective. All right, so I'll just let this play while I describe what it is. So this is a mouse lung, and it's a very commonly used model for IPF in the mouse where you bleomycin, it's a, it's a cancer drug actually, but it's very toxic, but you bleomycin intratracheally and still the mouse. And then two weeks later, you get this peak in fibrosis and this activation of myofibroblasts. And what's being imaged by confocal here is the extracellular matrix in white 
myofibroblasts in red, as marked by alpha spinosolactin, and then the endothelial cells uh, with GFP. And my main point here is that these are not two-dimensional, these are not cells sitting on a two-dimensional substrate. This is very much a three-dimensional space, and they're inside of this, this mixture of other cells and matrix. So we set off to try and model myofibroblast activation in 3D in a 3D setting. And we thought this was probably pretty simple to do. We already know that stiffness is a requirement for cells to undergo differentiation into myofibroblasts. So why don't we just encapsulate cells in 3D and tune the stiffness? And we would expect that the stiffer materials are going to give more myofibroblasts. So we needed parameters to make our hydrogels at different stiffnesses. We turned to that model of mouse uh, bleomycin treated mouse lung to quantify by AFM the change in stiffness as this tissue becomes fibrotic. So these images on the top right are uh, picker series red stain, which is for collagen. You can see that the red increases as collagen is being deposited. And then we measure by AFM the stromal space surrounding the alveoli and find that there is, in fact, this increase that's associated with this collagen deposition. <clears throat> Then we took the simplest synthetic approach to making a 3D hydrogel, which is to take a polymer backbone, modify it with a functional group, and then crosslink it with something that cells are able to cut. So the sequence that we use as a, as a crosslinker peptide is an MMP-sensitive uh, BPMS that's in the middle and on the left side. And then we can tune the stiffness of the material just by tuning the number of those crosslinks, just in the same way that polyacrylamide uh, stiffness is tuned by changing the number of crosslinks. So it's pretty easy to vary the cross-link density and get different stiffnesses over a range of what we measure in mouse lung. OK, so now uh, Dan, who is the grad student leading this work, he first started by repeating what we had seen in the literature and what I had shown you in a previous slide, of just making two-dimensional surfaces out of this gel material and then culturing lung fibroblasts on top of it treating them with TGF-beta-1, which is a pro-fibrotic soluble Q. It's a growth factor that induces myofibroblasts. And he varied the stiffness and found exactly what other people had reported. So as we increase the stiffness, I'm sorry that this line is right in the middle, but from sort of healthy physiologic lung stiffnesses up to fibrotic lung stiffnesses, we do in fact see that there's an increase in the activation of myofibroblasts as marked by alpha spinosolactin. The other thing that we measured here was the number of cells because the initiation of fibrosis is both an activation of myofibroblasts, but also just proliferation of the cells. And that typically, this is called a fibroproliferative response. All right, so this is all in good. Next, we took the same exact materials, same exact mechanics, and embedded the cells inside of this in 3D. And what we see is the opposite. So the more stiff and the more cross-linked the material is, the fewer alpha seamless lactin positive myofibroblasts and the fewer cells there are total, the less the proliferation. So why is this the case? Well, there's an artifact of these synthetic hydrogels. And uh, this is not a doctor on the sidewalk. It's actually an SEM of a cell embedded inside of a polyethylene glycol hydrogel. And what I want you to be able to appreciate is that relative to the scale of a cell, the pores are tiny. They're nanoscale pores. And this is quite distinct from the, the open porous networks of fibers that cells are inside of in stromal tissues. So because these are, because these are poly, individual polymer backbones that are angstroms wide, and there's a crosslink together, you get this nanoscale porosity that really has no, um, no similarity to the, the natural tissue spaces in our body. Excuse me. I'm, yes. I'm not clear. So what is exactly are we looking at on the left here? So the, the brown thing is a cell. And what type of cell? This is a fibroblast, fibroblast, and it's embedded in polyethylene glycol, which is okay. basically they freeze fracture this, and that's why you kind of yeah. see this. At this. Good. I, I also should mention sorry, it's never good to bottle up questions for the end, in, in my opinion, or bottle up anything for that matter. So if you have questions, just put your hand up, and I'll try to I'll try to monitor the chat as well. So, okay. so <laughs> to make sure to make sure I'm following that, is it the are you, are you saying it's the it's the core size or the extra dimension that's causing the inverse of the results. That you so in the case of the two-dimensional surfaces, this core size is irrelevant. The cells are sitting on top of the material. So they're never porosity just it's not, a, not, a, a, not a feature. Right. But in 3D, yes, absolutely, it's very much the pore size. And it's the difference between 
the scale of the, the, the monomer, essentially. So in this case, these are angstrom wide uh, polymer chains versus um, what forms the, the networks of, of uh, ECM in the body are these uh, micron scale fibers that cross link together to make networks. So as, as a result of the size of the building block, you get quite different core sizes. <laughs> Okay, so we need something more than just tuning the cross link density. And looking at the change in, in the amount of collagen inside of the tissue that leads to these changes in mechanics, we know very much it's the density of the fibers and probably also their cross linking that, are, that gives rise to these changes in mechanics. So this is SHG imaging, which is a way to measure collagen in, in tissues. And you can just appreciate that a rather sparse network of fibers becomes this crazy dense network of fibers. So we wanted to capture that feature, that change in fiber density that we know is really critical to disease. And one way that you can do that, there, there are probably multiple, but the group uh, the method that my group takes is using electrospinning of our polymeric materials. And then we can photo pattern these materials into individual fiber segments. They can then be functionalized with an adhesive ligand of choice. They can be picked up like almost like microspheres or like cells and embedded alongside with cells inside of the same hydrogel material that I showed you before. So now we have a composite system that has fibers that are adhesive to cells, just like collagen fibers or fibronectin fibers are, and it's embedded inside of a proteolytically degradable bulk hydrogel, which will actually models the ground substance, which is the proteoglycan component of the stroma. Because it's a composite material and it's synthetic, we have pretty good control over things. So we can tune the density of the fibers and that perturbation is what I'm really gonna focus on because we think it has relevance uh, to the conversion of the tissue space as it becomes fibrotic. So we repeated similar types of studies and encapsulate fibroblasts for three days. And after three days, when we look to see what they're doing phenotypically, we measure a few things that we associate with a, a movement towards becoming a myofibroblast. So in each of these uh, kind of chunks, there's a different density of fibers. The left, you can think of as, as no fibers, which is probably not physiologic, but maybe 0 0.5, a low density of fibers would be the physiologic condition. And then we uh, imaged by immunostaining fibronectin, which is uh, an extracellular matrix protein that gets secreted at increasing rates as cells become activated. YAF, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, but it's a measure of mechanic active state of a cell. And generally, YAF will shuttle to the nucleus if the cell is sort of uh, strongly engaging and highly contractile. And then KI67, which is just an antibody for a proliferating, uh, proliferating cell. So across, uh, the, uh, across all these different measurements, we see that fiber density has a pretty potent effect on inducing matrix synthesis, activation of a cell into a more mechanically uh, active state, and proliferation. And if we measure inflammatory cytokines, we see that a high fiber density modeling the sarcotic state starts to lead these cells to be more inflammatory, which is what we would associate with disease. Um, and in addition, we also perform some gene expression characterization, and we see a number of, of genes associated with myofibroblast stuff. So active 2 is actually the gene for alpha smooth muscle actin. Uh, CDH11 is OB coherent, which is sort of the fibrotic coherent um, matrix components of collagen and fibronectin uh, and connective tissue growth factor. <clears throat> And if we wait another six days, then we see the act activation of these cells. So as marked by alpha smooth muscle actin, that marker for a bona fide myofibroblast, we see that a, a fibrotic fiber density leads to the activation of these cells. And interestingly, these, these form networks of connected cells. If we take away the adhesive ligand, so we embed the same density of fibers, but there's no way for the cells to engage those fibers, we don't see activation of these cells. So the, we know that uh, this tells us that the cells actually need to engage the fibers in order to undergo this differentiation of that. <clears throat> uh, this is just a quantification of, of this data here, um, but essentially the gist is that a heightened fiber density in this 3D model allows us to activate these cells. Over a little, a uh, few more days, a week more, um, we see some evidence of, of functional changes to these tissues. So. I mentioned earlier the contracture that leads to organ failure. Um, so we see, we, we measure uh, the contraction of the gels. So these dashed lines show you initially how big was the gel. And over two weeks, we see differences in the contraction as a function of the density of the fibers and the number of myofibroblasts that are living within these tissues. In addition to contraction, 
We also find changes in the stiffness. So we know that as they're secreting matrix, this is leading these tissues to, to densify and also stiffen, uh, probably through cross-linking and matrix secretion. And then over a, a few more days, um, we can image the collagen uh, content uh, by SHG, as I mentioned before, or measure biochemically. And we see again that these fibrotic matrices lead to heightened collagen deposition. So what is this all useful for? Well, compound screening right now in pharma, and many people are after antifibrotic drugs, is still performed in 2D tissue culture plastic, not even on elastomer hydrogels. And so we did sort of a low throughput drug screen on uh, comparing our 3D model to the standard, the gold standard, the currently used uh, model of tissue culture plastic. And we tested a few drugs. So perfenidone and nintenonib are both clinically used to treat idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, we tested those individually and in combination together. Uh, dimethylfumarate, all the way on the right side, is a drug that's being currently tested for systemic sclerosis, and it's known to potently inhibit YAP activation. And then Merimistep, we decided to test because, for one, we know that prote proteolysis in our model is really important, as versus in two-dimensional models, the cells don't really need to degrade anything uh, to undergo activation. So, we decided to check that, and we actually found out there was a strong interest in using Merimistat to treat, <clears throat> treat fibrosis uh, back in the 90s, which eventually failed for reasons you can ask me about. <clears throat> so I'll just pop up all the data here, but this is a quantification on the left side of the two-dimensional, the two measures that I mentioned of number of myofibroblasts and amount of proliferation. And then on the right side, our 3D model. And the thing that I want to point out is that the two drugs that are known to work clinically have no effect in the 2D model. So if compound screening had been performed to identify those, they would have failed. They would never have found those drugs. <clears throat> and in contrast, those two drugs have an effect in the 3D model. If they're comboed together, the effect is even more. Um, DMF works in both cases, and this is probably because it's downstream. It's a downstream, or it's inhibiting something that's downstream, which is YAP activation. And then Merimistap, the MNP inhibitor, that works in the 3D model because MMPs are required, but obviously has no effect in 2D. All right, so I'll wrap up the first part, um, but I'll just argue that synthetic materials offer us some advantages. I think user-defined composition and tunability and degradability, um, but I would argue that also that simply putting cells in 3D is not enough. We need to think about the structure, the porosity of topography, as well as the mechanics and degradability of these, of these tissue spaces that we're trying to model. Um, I didn't have time to go over it, but in this paper, which you can check out if you're interested, we also went into the human IPF single-cell RNA-seq data sets and found that matrix uh, remodeling, and in particular MMPs, are really uh, upregulated in, in IPF, which is kind of interesting because I talked about synthesis and cross-linking. I didn't really talk about degradation as the way that uh, this tissue or this disease progresses, but as much as synthesis and, and cross-linking needs, <coughs> needs to occur, MMP activity and degradation also simultaneously needs to occur. And lastly, with uh, that, that final drug screen, we showed that 2D versus 3D models can uh, reveal these distinct cellular requirements. And I think that capturing these specific requirements is part of what we need to move towards if we want to uh, be better at identifying compounds. So I'll just stop right now for a second. Any other questions on this first part before I keep going? Yeah. So maybe you're kind of getting to this a bit when you talk about considering porosity and topography, but I'm wondering if you can independently modulate um, things like matrix stiffness, right, with the fiber density versus adhesion sites. So you know, changes in cell shape, and how can you decouple those two responses due to those different things? So changes in adhesive ligand versus yeah, adhesive like ligand density, right, versus you know, if you increase fiber density, the cells are able to, they have more places to grab onto that matrix. Mm -hmm. But the matrix is also stiffer, mm -hmm. right? So can you ever decouple those? You could tune the density of the ligand on the fibers, but it's probably not, a, that's part of an artificial way to, to do it. I mean, one of the challenges that we face is how much ligand you put on these fibers, how available is a binding site on a collagen integral. And that's actually a very hard, hard thing to, compute because of the way collagen hierarchically assembles. Um, so you could do it artificially and just changing the density of the, the, the ligand on an individual fiber, and then you have another layer of control of just how many fibers there are, but that would 
say, confluence mechanics. But maybe it's not ideal to think about them as two separate components because how cells engage for fiber mechanically is going to be very dependent on the density of the ligand and the ability of the cell to cluster integrants in the form of ovulation. Um, I don't think that was a good answer, but it, yeah, I think it's tough to exactly model, even though we're capturing some aspects of this fibrous topography and maybe some interesting mechanics of these tissue spaces. These are still not native tissues by, by any measure. It's just one step towards that, I would say. Yeah. I have a question not related to that. It's got come to my mind if, uh, for example, the fiber is aligned and the cell is attaching on the surface, but cell are randomly attached. For example, it's attached on on the fiber on the fiber surface. How the fiber alignment helping to give the cell alignment if if it's just a sticky on the surface. It will be randomly stick here on the surface, then this net fiber arrangement is not acting right. But how how can alignment are helping them to if I understand the question you're asking how does how do cells take a alignment cue of the fibers yeah, and yeah, become yeah. aligned at the time? Yeah. And we could talk probably for an hour about this. <laughs> briefly, there's so cells are initially kind of randomly extending protrusions. And they're forming small contacts, nascent adhesions. Mm -hmm. And then there needs to be a mechanical feedback from the matrix in order to, for the cell to say go or no go on growing that adhesion. And if the cell grows in that adhesion, it's like it's committing to that direction a little bit. Mm -hmm. And imagine this occurring over and over and over, multiple protrusions, and the cell is like changing its shape gradually because it's deciding, oh, this direction is stiffer than this transverse direction. And that, that's one aspect of context guidance and alignment of cells in response to a mechanical anisogeny. It's like pref preferential adhesion development. And as the cell commits and forms a solid anchorage there, and now in the next generation of protrusions, will preferentially extend in that direction. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We, yeah, we could talk more about some of the other aspects of context sure. guidance. Yeah. So I think my question goes back to the beginning um, when you mentioned that fibroblast proliferation is like a positive feedback as more scar tissue forms, more cells proliferate. And I wanted to know, does the immune system take part in any of this process interfere in any way? Absolutely. Yeah, the immune system is the driver. So people focus on the fibroblast because it is the closest thing to tissue failure. But what's driving this initially is macrophages primarily. So you have tissue engineer, uh, tissue injury, you have macrophage recruitment, those cells become activated into M1 or M2, you know, that, that whole thing is widely debated. But one of the main things they do is they secrete TGF beta 1, which is the major probiotic growth factor. And I, I didn't highlight it in our studies, but in all of our studies, we're adding TGF beta 1 basically to model the fact that macrophages would be in these tissues. We just don't have them in our, in our culture systems. But yeah, the, the macrophages, so sort of persistent inflammation, continual recruitment of macrophages to a tissue. And their secretion of TGF beta 1 in addition to other anti or uh, inflammatory cytokines is what's driving the maintained activation of these cells up until the point where I think the cell, the matrix has changed so much that the fibroblasts can be self sustaining and self propagating. But yeah, initially it's all about immune, immune cells. Absolutely. Yep. Um, I have a couple of quick questions for you. Um, what was the size of your fibers um, for genomic? What was that? And then um, how what technique are you using for ligand immobilization? And how do you quantify the amount of ligands immobilized, especially in terms of, you know, how, how, how specifically can you quantify and what's your sensitivity for that? So, yeah, the, the question about how we functionalize these. So, the section vinyl sulfone, and that vinyl sulfone group, you can do a Michael type addition as long as you have a thiolated peptide. Okay. So that, that's just like a pH 7.6 and you react it that way. In terms of quantifying adhesive ligand density, that's pretty challenging to do, but usually the way we do it is with a fluorophore tagged thiolated mm -hmm. peptide. And then we'll do, you know, it's not true quantification, but we can do relative quantification of the intensity of the fluorophore and sort of map that back to our input concentrations of, of the ligand. Of course, and you do that in 3D? And we do that on those fibers prior to encapsulating them in the 3D. And then yeah. Yeah. Okay. So in these models, the hydro, the bulk hydrogel material doesn't have an adhesive ligand. It's just the fibers that have that. 
What was, was the, the first size question? of the, the size uh, of the yeah. fibers? So these are 1.5 micron fibers. We can kind of tune them over the range of like one to two microns. But, yeah. okay. um, we found we found some interesting literature saying that collagen fibers on the order of one to two microns are really what's operative in the peritumoral space in the breast. And ever since then, we've sort of just not played with that parameter. Okay. Yeah. Good. All right. I will keep on going for the sake of time. I talked about the stroma and the fibrous networks that compose the stroma, and I also talked about the fibroblasts that live there. There's another key part which is not in the model that I showed you in the first part, which is the capillaries, the vasculature. <laughs> that provides these tissue spaces with nutrients and removes waste, et cetera. So for the second part of the talk, I wanted to focus on um, one of our models for capturing capillary scale uh, vessels. And the way that we do this is by inducing angiogenesis into 3D materials. Uh, and this is work from uh, William, who was actually my first grad student who recently departed, uh, not, not Earth, uh, departed for his postdoc. Uh, so the model that we use is a microphysiologic chip where we can, uh, at, at scale, at least at a scale of eight different chips at a time, we can cast a hydrogel that has these channels running through it. And then these channels can be endothelialized with whatever endothelial cell type you're, you're interested in. They eventually form a patent lumen where the cells are connected into this confluent monolayer uh, where the cell cell junctions are enriched with B coherent, which is the coherent that endothelial cells uh, use to maintain barrier function. So we can form these endothelialized tubes inside hydrogels of choice. And typically we do this in a format with two different tubes running parallel to each other. We'll just endothelialize one, the top one. And then in the adjacent tube, we can add chemokines and growth factors. And if we wait enough time, the cells will start becoming activated and they'll invade off of that parent vessel tube into the matrix. And this has been a really nice model of angiogenic sprouting, which is how uh, in, in most adult systems, the vasculature expands. And in wound healing, it's uh, like why my cut is so red. There's an increased vascular density from angiogenesis. So this angiogenic process has a number of steps that we, we sort of view as, as individual components to overall this process that's occurring iteratively. There's the activation of cells off of this confluent monolayer. Then there's invasion of those cells. And the, the invasion is followed by stock cells, cells that make up sort of the stock of this invading sprout. And those stock cells need to proliferate and with sufficient proliferation and cell density, uh, as well as sufficient cues from the, the extracellular space, this structure can luminize, meaning it opens up inside. And then as this thing traverses through tissue space, if it eventually connects to another parent vessel, uh, you can anastomose and, and maybe there's some maturation process involving other cells, pericytes, but I'm not gonna talk about that. So we set off to just identify um, whether there was this relationship between, I, I mentioned migration, and then I mentioned proliferation of the stock cells. And so those two pieces we thought might be uh, obviously both important, but there might be some balance between them that needs to occur in order to get good functional vessels. So we tried to identify really simple compounds that selectively influence chemotactic invasion versus proliferation of endothelial cells. And the one that we chose for chemotaxis is sphingosine 1-phosphate. Uh, it's, it's a lipid signaler, and it is well known to be chemotactic for a number of different cell types. And so in this chip model, I'm going to show you the parent vessel um, and the boundary of it. And then off to the right is where the other channel is that's, that's eluding uh, the sphingosine 1-phosphate. And um, we just tuned the concentration that we added to that vessel. So this is just varying the density, uh, the gradient, the strength of the gradient in this tissue space. And so what I think you can appreciate is that we, as if we increase the strength of this S1P gradient, we see more and more cells invading. But I think you also know that these cells look pretty terrible. So there's a lot of, um, a lot of cell death. Uh, so even though many of them are invading, they're not doing this in, in a very connected fashion. When we measure uh, proliferation, we see that despite adding different concentrations of S1P and inducing more migration, we're really having no impact on proliferation, and the rate of proliferation is actually quite low. So if there were stock cells, they weren't dividing, and we know that that division is really important for this connectivity of the sprout as it invades. So next we added PMA, which is a PKC activator, and one of the things that PKC activation can do is induce proliferation. And we see that we can rescue this connectivity. So 
uh, at a fixed concentration of, of PMA across these different concentrations of the chemotactic Q, we see that at some levels, at lower concentrations of S1P, we can get nice collective multicellular sprouts that are invading. Although in the bottom, we see some evidence of disconnection between those. So the same images, but now I'll just show you quantification of how connected are these structures. So what Willie did was he wrote some code to be able to extract the number of single cells in these 3D image stacks, the number of collective multicellular structures, and then we can take a ratio between those two to get a sense of overall how collective is the migration in, in the tissue space. And so we can see that at lower concentrations of SMP, um, but uh, with PMA present, we can get fairly collective um, high sprout single ratios. So this is the case that migration and proliferation in some ways both need to be present, that we would expect that there needs to be a balance. And if we could uh, toggle the PMA, toggle the amount of proliferation with the rate of invasion, then in all conditions, we could achieve multicellular structures. So in the next experiment, this is sort of the, the condition I showed previously of an intermediate level of S1P and an intermediate level of PMA, where we get collective sprouts. If we go to a higher concentration of S1P, but we also up the PMA concentration, we see more invasion, and we also maintain the connectivity of the invading sprouts. And then on the flip side, if we go lower in the chemotactic gradient and lower in the rate of proliferation, there's less and in, less invasion or less depth of invasion, but there's still multicellular structures that are invading. Why does this matter? Why does the connectivity of these invading cells matter? Well, you can imagine that if cells are losing their connections, those are not going to be continuous tracks for fluid flow, for blood flow. So the way that we assess perfusibility is just by adding fluorescent beads to one side after we've let these vessels anastomose with the other side. And what this looks like is left side has the beads and they're just flowing through this, this vessel bed network. So I'll just pop all this data because it's pretty intuitive. You, I'm sorry. Yes. Can you explain how that, that last uh, sequence, how you obtain that? I mean, are these, um, these, flowing cell, these flowing cells, is that an animation or is that? Uh, uh, this is a time lapse, time lapse image. The yellow are fluorescent microspheres. Uh, microspheres, okay. Yeah. Oh. okay. Sorry. Let me get that to play again. Yep. So we just will I add see. fluorescent microspheres to the top left and they'll yep. just flow in. And then because of hydrostatic pressure difference, they'll flow across the vessel bed. So this is performing that assay across our different conditions of balance, which is what I just showed you a movie of. And then here is when we have low proliferation. And here's when we have excessive migration. So that the top is too little PMA and the bottom is too much S1P. And what you can, I think, pretty clearly appreciate is that if you have disconnected vessel beds, there is no flow across the vessel bed. Essentially, the beads, the, the microspheres all get stuck in these blunt-ended structures that are um, branching off of the parent vessel. So connectivity of these invading sprouts is really important if you want to form luminized, perfusible vessels. The other um, key aspect of, of capillaries and just endothelium in general is uh, maintenance of barrier function. So uh, generally, you want things to go out, but not of a certain size. You want to be able to regulate exactly what's going in and out of endothelium to the, to the surrounding tissue. So this is our way of uh, assessing diffusive permeability. We'll uh, let the sprouts connect to the other side. Then we'll add a dextran that's fluorescently tagged to the endothelial channel. It'll flow in just like those beads. And then we can time-lapse image it and get a sense for how fast is it diffusing out of the vessel structures. So in the case of making nice connected vessel beds, we see that permeability is low, which is what you would want in a mature endothelium. In the case of either low proliferation or, or high migration, those two failure modes that I've described where you get these uh, blunt-ended structures and disconnected vessel beds, perfusibility is, is high. You can see that the dextran is leaking out quite quickly, uh, and that's not a good, that's not good barrier function. <clears throat> so overall, um, we, we studied a couple things in this paper, and I invite you to check it out if you're interested in more of the details. Uh, we looked at the soluble factors, but we also tuned some of the matrix uh, mechanics and found that that's also part of it. You can imagine that if the matrix is really dense, then invasion is going to be slower. And so then you would need to toggle the soluble factors in order to achieve good, uh, good vessels that invade through this material. Um, but overall, this idea of focusing on the collectivity of these sprouts has been really helpful for us in thinking about design criteria of materials, where always we want to be able to have 
migration, but we need to have materials that allow proliferation so that we get this nice connectivity of vessel struts. I'll stop uh, now just for questions. I see, I'm running out of time, although we've taken some questions already. Yes. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, uh, mechanism wise, the part that you were describing the tubulation of the, um, of the uh, angiogenesis formation, right? Would that uh, be also in effect that the same mechanism is in effect for the T tubule formation in cardiac cells? Ooh, T tubule formation. I think that's, that's a totally also, different thing. That's also a lumen. Um, yeah, but it's at a different cell scale. And yeah, so T tubule formation is these imaginations and the, the cell surface that bring calcium. And yeah, I think it's quite different. We don't know a lot about the luminization process other than we know that our critical cell density. So thinking about one of these structures, there needs to be a certain number of cells per length before we ever see luminization. And the material needs to be sufficiently permissive to degradation, which I think makes sense because the structure needs to widen a bit for limbs to form. Um, but other than that, we don't know anything else. And I don't know anything about T2 build formation. I just know what they, what they are. So I, I would assume it's quite dis distinct given the, the different length scales and the different proteins and mechanics that are involved. A lot of the proteins were matched as where you taught me, that's why I asked. So it's interestingly that the mechanism that you described is exactly the mechanism that falls in the developmental stages of that, but I'm not sure if it matches. Um, um, I mean, a study can help that. Mm. that would, yeah, that would be I would appreciate really it. Thank you. All right, so I talked about connectivity, and that's a good thing and helpful for engineering vessel beds if you're thinking about. Uh, generating a tissue that has a vasculature to support some, some cell type of interest. What I'm going to focus on in the last part is the failure mode. So I have cells... one more question before you go. I'm <laughs> yeah. so sorry. Uh, the dyes, the fluorescent dyes that you're using, have you seen any difference in mechanical behavior of your cells when you use it and don't use it specifically? Fluorescent dextrans, no. Not yeah. at all. Those, those don't seem to affect endothelial cells. And I know that dextran is, it's used as a blood filler. Uh -huh. So in terms of like cytotoxicity, I don't think it's cytotoxic material. Yeah. All right, so I'm going to focus on the failure mode of disconnected cells. And what I'll try to uh, convince you of is bad angiogenesis that leads to disconnected cells is a part of fibrosis. So we're going to go back to the topic of the first part. Skip this. All right, so we got interested in endothelium because obviously we're interested in endothelial cells, we're interested in fibrosis. And we know that in many of these uh, fibrotic diseases, there's this huge, huge and dramatic change in um, in the capillary architecture of the tissue. So in liver, this is an example from liver where they treat mice with carbon tetrachloride, it's also a poison, um, and it induces this really uh, profound cirrhotic liver uh, in, in mouse. So again, if you can see this red stain for collagen, you can see this red intensifying over the course of a 12-month 12, 12 period. And if you look at the vasculature, even under a shorter time point, so just that initial change of, uh, from, from uh, control to, to two months after treatment of carbon tetrachloride, there's this expansion of CD31, which is a marker for endothelial cells. And when we looked at these images, we were kind of struck by the fact that these endothelial cells uh, at two months, they don't look very connected. They don't look like capillaries. They look like cells that are just sort of invading off on their own. Um, I'll skip this data for the sake of time, but it's just some human, some other data from another paper showing that in human, there's a strong correlation between the endothelial cells and the fibrotic, uh, the amount of matrix that's in this fibrotic tissue in the liver. So um, we got interested in how, how do matrix changes, and particularly these changes in fiber density, influence endothelial cells in the angiogenic process. And so to get at this, I'm just going to combine the part from the, the model from the first part with the model from the second part. So we have our electrospun uh, fiber segments that we're functionalizing with the adhesive ligand. And then we can cast these inside of that bulk hydrogel, same thing as before, except uh, this bulk hydrogel we chose uh, to be fibrin because we know fibrin is pretty enriched in fibrotic tissues. And then we put that inside of the microfluidic system. And here you can just see uh, a rotation of what these fibers embedded inside of fibrin inside of one of these microfluidic chips looks like. So um, the fibers can be oriented so that they radiate away from the vessel, or we can also flow them in a different direction to radiate them in, this, in the same direction as the vessel. And I'll show you data uh, of those two scenarios in the next slide. 
So we see these with endothelial cells and then we wait two days. And what we found that was quite interesting was that the density of the fibers has an influence on the invasion of TIP cells. And this is without adding any kind of S1P or any kind of chemotactic um, component or growth factor. So this is sort of like an auto sprouting. The cells are sensing the surrounding material uh, surrounding this parent vessel, and then they're undergoing an activation event and invading into the matrix. And the more fibers there are, the more this looks like a fibrotic matrix surrounding a capillary or, or actually an arterial, given the scale of this vessel, the more they start to invade on, on their own. If we orient the, uh, the fibers parallel to the vessel, we don't see any of this activation whatsoever. And I didn't really um, talk about this in those images that I showed of, of the tumor, but this is actually a known mechanism in which tumor cells are prevented from escaping. So if the matrix surrounding a tumor is oriented uh, circumferentially around the tumor, the cells are not allowed to escape. But if that, if that collagen eventually becomes organized radially away from the tumor, now cells have a way to, to escape from the tumor metastasize. So I think there's a number of parallels to what happens in cancer and what these endothelial cells are doing. So we looked at the, um, what exactly is, is happening here, and I mentioned permeability uh, before, but when cells undergo activation and invasion in order to angiogenically sprout, they typically have to lower their perme permeability. They have to sort of let go of their neighbors in order to start invading into the matrix. So we measured permeability as a function of the density of the fibers surrounding the vessel. And we see that um, with this heightened fiber density modeling more of a fibrotic condition, permeability is low. So this would lead us to think that something's happening with barrier, uh, with barrier function, and this is probably coming from the fact that cells are losing their junctions with each other. So we next quantify those junctions. I mentioned B cadherin before as, as the major coherent that endothelial cells use. Um, we had to perform these in a different model in order to get enough protein to do Western blotting on, but essentially the gist of it is that cells, endothelial cells, when they engage fibers, they downregulate their BE cadherin, and we think this is what's allowing them to lose their connectivity and start invading into the matrix. Uh, and this was just an image, an immunostain image of BE cadherin. You can see that BE cadherin is not completely gone, but the size, the thickness of these, of these connections between their neighboring cells as well as the intensity of the B coherent is decreasing. I'm going to skip that. Essentially, we um, modulated permeability, the number of permeability agonists, to so try to force cells to lose their connections. And what we see is that as you do that, you get more and more invading cells. So it really is through um, loss of cell cell connections that these cells are be being able to invade and activate into these tip cells. In terms of the requirements um, that cells, uh, requirements for cells to become activated in invasive tip cells, we see that again, they need to be able to engage the fibers that are, that are in the surrounding matrix. They need some, some ability to become activated uh, through YAP localization to the nucleus. As we treat with dimethyl fumarate, we can also reduce the number of those invading cells. They need proteolysis. So if we inhibit MMP activity, we see fear of these invading cells, which I think is intuitive, given that there is matrix that they need to be cleaving in order to, to invade. Um, and they also need contractility. So if we treat with myosin inhibitor, bloody stem, or a rock inhibitor, YT7, both of those will have the effect of decreasing the number of these active tip cells. I also mentioned some connections to cancer. So in cancer, that activation event and escape is associated with EMT programming. Uh, which is epithelial to mesenchymal transition, but it's essentially a cell going from a barrier lining type cell into more like a fibroblastic mesenchymal cell. Um, and it's associated with a number of, of different markers that get uh, upregulated inside of the cell, but in particular, SNL1 is um, sort of considered a, a very common master regulator of transcriptional programming associated with EMT. So in our model of these invading endothelial cells, we stained for SNL1, and we see that indeed these tip cells that are invading have snail localized to the nucleus, which is where uh, transcription factor would be going if it's uh, inducing programming. And uh, similar types of studies on two-dimensional surfaces that we can get enough cells for gene expression, we show that engagement with the fibrous topography leads these endothelial cells to upregulate snail as well as slug and cadherin and cadherin and downregulate what they should normally be expressing if they're good barrier cells, which is the cadherin. All right, so what do these variant cells do? 
we performed our microarray, and in order to get enough cells for a microarray, we just bulk encapsulated endothelial cells inside of a fiber matrix with these, this heightened density of fibers. And we compared that just to a bare fiber and hydrogel where the cells are also individual, but they're not engaging matrix, the, the synthetic matrix fibers. So we performed this microarray analysis across these different conditions. Short of it is that a lot of things are changing, but I think some of the most interesting things are genes that are associated with immune and, and immune re regulation and cytokine secretion, um, angiogenesis and wound healing. And a number of these um, are pro-inflammatory pro cytokines. So we think that these, these cells that are, have lost their connection to other endothelial cells and they're tightly engaging the matrix are an inflammatory cue for the tissue. And then we went on to uh, not only quantify some inflammatory cytokines, but also measure TGF-beta-2, which, as I mentioned, is of the class of the pro-fibrotic growth factors. And we see that these cells that are embedded as, as isolated cells inside of this, this fibrotic matrix are, are increasing their expression of TGF-beta-2 as measured by ELISA. So TGF-beta-2 could lead to the activation of fibroblasts into myofibroblasts. But in our model, we don't have fibroblasts. We just asked whether the TGF-beta-2 being secreted by these cells could be influencing that parent vessel from which they came. Um, so on the left is a vessel that's formed in the normal, just pure fibrin. And then the right is the, the fibrotic matrix with, with the synthetic fibers inside of it. And when we add TGF-beta-2 to these parent vessels, we see that there is some activation and invasion of cells, but more so what occurs is apoptosis. And I already showed you some data uh, to show that engagement with the fibrous topography is regulating um, the adherence junction and the connectivity of cells. And so um, what we think is happening is that as the cells lose their connectivity to each other, they become more susceptible to TGF-beta-2. And this allows some of them to undergo apoptosis and some of them to invade. And we don't really know why, why that's the case at this point, but that's kind of where we're going right now. All right. So uh, just to wrap up, the third part, uh, we talked about one of the questions is about immune system and the immune cells and macrophages. I think that's really important. Um, fibroblasts has been long to date the focus of, of the field, uh, but I would argue that we, we need to continually expand our model systems and incorporate multiple cell types and think about other cells beyond the fibroblasts that we really want to capture the complexity of fibrotic diseases. And on the left there are just some images of the mouse lung and the bleomycin model that I mentioned before. And lectin is a way to, to label all the vasculature in the lung. And I hope what you can appreciate I move that is that the regions that have this expanded vasculature, super dense lectin staining, are also the regions that are the most fibrotic in the lung. So there's definitely some association between uh, the vasculature and, uh, and the progression of fibrosis in at least this mouse model of, of lung fibrosis. So think beyond the fibroblast. Um, in, in our work, we're showing that this densified matrix fibers around these parent vessels can have a an influence on auto-activating these cells and inducing tip cell formation. And these tip cells don't, are never followed by toxins. They invade as single cells and we think they're highly inflammatory. Um, and if that's the case, and if they're having an effect on inflammation and the recruitment of, of other cells like immune cells, perhaps they're secreting TGF-beta that activates fibroblasts, or they're inducing vessel death from, from um, the other vasculature that's present nearby, those all could be mechanisms in which this this situation becomes worse in which um, uh, signaling, fibrotic signaling can be reinforced independent of the first part uh, of the talk of fibroblast secreted matrix. So with that, I'll thank you guys for, uh, for attending. And uh, this thank my, my group. Um, all the work here was done by uh, William Wang and, and Dan Matera and through some collaborations with uh, Beth Moore, Bill Polchek, and uh, Matt Cutis. So. See, we're exactly at 10, but if there's more questions, please uh, ask now or come, come up afterwards.